Good morning. Welcome to Duluth Gospel Tabernacle. This is Julie. And Bill. We are usually the ones greeting you at the door on a Sunday morning, ready to give you a bulletin and a hug. Or a handshake. We miss you all so much, but we are happy to welcome you to our stream this morning. Of course, we want to know that you are with us. So comment below, say hi, who you're watching with, and where you are. Also, please hit the share button so that it's easier for more people to join us. We won't be handing you a bulletin today. But did you know that all our sermon notes are available on our website? They are? Go to www.DuluthGospelTabernacle.org And of course, like and follow Duluth Gospel Tabernacle on Facebook to stay up to date throughout the week for announcements, devotionals, and more. Thanks again for joining us. It's always nice to gather together with the DPT family. Hurry up and get settled. Our service is about to begin. Good morning. It's great to have you with us today. Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever, and his faithfulness continues through all generations. Thank you for joining us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can come before you with praise and thanksgiving. We can enter into your presence. Wherever we are, we can be here and be there and be in your presence. So thank you for that. Lord, be with us today as we worship you and as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. Amen. Why don't you stand with us as we sing? Like 
the sound of symphony to my ears. It's like holy water, your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of symphony to my ears. It's like holy so good to worship the Lord, to reflect on the Holy Spirit and what it does for us, and just honor him and just tell him how holy he is, how holy he is. Oh, wow. I don't know about you, but that just resonates in my heart. I am Pastor Rebecca, and we want to welcome you to Duluth Gospel Tabernacle today. We thank you for watching our videos and we thank you for joining us from wherever you are today. 
I don't know about you, but I have found myself sometimes walking on a walk while listening to our services, and it's just a blessing that we can all gather together. And I hope that right now you're putting in the comments hello to each other, because that is the kind of greeting that we can do right now. And it's so good to see all of you here. Some of you we haven't seen for a while, and we welcome you back. And some of you have come every week, and we're just so grateful that you're here. Thank you for watching, thank you for your patience, and thank you for your encouragement. We appreciate it so much. Just a reminder that if you have not connected with us, if you would like to get our emails or get a letter from us, please go on our, our website and go into the contact us or connect with us and fill it out and we would love to uh, be in connection with you like that. Um, we are looking forward to um, being able to meet together as a church and meeting here at the in the sanctuary. There is just nothing like seeing your faces. We miss you all, and we've been hearing that many of you are missing getting together as well. But the great thing is that there's still so much technology. There's the technology of the videos that you're watching even today, phone calls, emails, Instagram. We can all be together, and even that really technical thing called writing a letter, you could do that as well. Please stay connected to other Christians through phone calls, Facebook, Instagram, or now that we're allowed to meet in 10, a backyard bonfire, or another family. With that in mind, I would like to invite Devin up to tell, tell us a little bit about what's happening in youth ministry. Hey guys, what's up? I'm Devin. I'm the interim youth director here. And momentum, um, we have a lot going on. Um, we're just super excited. We're super excited to be with you. Um, we're in a series called Ghosted. Next week, actually, Jim is speaking, so make sure to tune in to our Wednesday night services if you're not watching our adult services. Um, we are hanging out after every service um, in, a, in a Zoom call, just unscripted. We're just hanging out trying to reconnect with everybody. And um, starting next week on Thursdays, we're going to have a junior high hangout at noon and then a senior high hangout at 1. Also, um, this year, we planned on going to New Orleans for Action Corps. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID and restrictions on travel and just for overall safety for everyone, um, we are not going to New Orleans this year. Um, that was a super hard decision. We believe that, that God put that on Dylan's heart for a reason. And we do want to honor that, but we cannot do that this year. So instead, um, we are trying to figure out prayerfully what Action Corps is going to look like this year. And so just be praying with us as, as our leaders um, and our pastoral staff. Um, just prayerfully make decisions on Action Corps and what that's going to look like. So that's all, ha that's all I have. I'm going to give it back to Rebecca. So here you go. Thank you, Devin. One thing about those, hang, those, those hangs for the kids, it's really up to us as parents to make sure we help our kids get into that. So I just want to encourage you to be on the um, Duluth, uh, the, the Momentum Facebook or Instagram, because that's how you'll know. And again, kids are kind of you know, trying to finish up with school, and so for us as parents, we can help them. I am the children's pastor here, and I would just like to also remind you that on Wednesday nights at 6.30, we do children's church. Actually, at 6, there's rainbows. On Sunday morning at 9.45, we have children's church, and if you've missed it, you can watch it this afternoon and, or anytime on Facebook or the YouTube. We have a Zoom Bible study Tuesdays and Thursdays and just all kinds of things that we're doing. Tonight, we would like to welcome you to Total Request Worship, a Total Request Live Worship with Jim and Jonathan. They're going to be having a worship night. Well, they'll have a few songs, and then they're just going to sing what you request. I am really looking forward to that. So this will be a time of worship, and we just want to encourage you that will be live tonight at 7 at, on Facebook. Also, on Friday, I would like to welcome the entire church to a church-wide virtual beach party barbecue. You're probably you're going to have to provide your own beach, 
and your own barbecue and probably even a beach ball or two. But we would just love you to join. There's going to be some fun. You'll be seeing some things ahead of time to tell you how to set up and prepare. You know, be sure to get, you know, your wildest Hawaiian outfit on and get ready and pull the whole family together. It'll be fun as we as a church have a virtual um, beach party barbecue. Bring your own beach and bring your own barbecue. Um, at this time, we're going to have a prayer. And this is when we get together as a community and we pray for our church community, the needs. And um, if you have any specific needs, we ask you specifically to call us, text us, private message us. We want to pray with and for you. This week, um, Billy Brackett went home to be with Jesus, and so we want to pray for, for um, his family. And we also want to just spend time thanking God for... Um, our country, and those who gave their life for our country. So if you could bow with me right now, I would really appreciate it. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today, and I just thank you. You are holy. Lord, knowing you is sweet. It's, it's precious, God. And we thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, as we've been learning that that. The, the way that the Holy Spirit comes into our life, Lord. And we thank you, God, for um, your presence in our life. And we depend on it, God. We can't make it without it. Today, Lord, we pray for our community, and we pray especially, Lord, for um, the family of Billy Brackett, who went to be with Jesus this week, Lord. We pray, God, that you will just give them comfort and peace as they walk through this. God, with all the things that are going on this week with um, just the different, uh, with, with Governor Walls, with, with what we know to be a lot of layoffs happening, God, we pray, we pray, we seek your face, Lord. We need you, God. We ask, oh Lord, that you would come in and you would put your foot down on this COVID, if I may say chaos, Lord. We pray, oh God, that you would, would, would bring peace and that you would help us as your people to walk it out as you called us to. Lord, that we would know how to respond and that we would know how to be your, the light and the salt of this earth. Lord, we pray for those who are in anxious, who, are, who have anxiety, who are dealing with addictions, Lord. We pray for the marriages in our church, Lord. We pray for all of the people in our church who are without jobs right now. God, we thank you. We thank you that we do not know what tomorrow holds, but we confidently know who holds tomorrow. We trust you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to have a very special presentation now to honor those who have given their life for our country. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, and we thank the many, many people who um, sacrificed their lives for our country, and many, many who are still actively sacrificing for our country. And so we want to honor the veterans. If, if the veterans were here today, we would stand and we would clap. And I want you to know that I clap for you. And I would just love for you to know that this next presentation is our way of saying thank you.
My name is Jennifer Cora Spihar, retired senior master sergeant. I had 31 years of service with the 148th Fighter Wing Duluth Air National Guard, a branch of the Air Force. In my opinion, Memorial Day, formerly known as Decoration Day, is a day to honor and remember those that have died while serving our country. Freedom isn't free. I've learned we can reflect and pay respect to our fallen heroes on Memorial Day by flying the U.S. flag at half-staff until noon, observing a moment of silence with a prayer at 3 p.m., and placing flags or flowers, typically poppies, on veterans' graves. Hi, this is Stan Miller. I proudly served in the U.S. Army in the 1st Cav Division and then over in the infantry, also in Fort Hood, but over in Fairbanks, Alaska, I served in the uh, infantry division. And I obtained rank of Spec 4. Memorial Day is a time of uh, reflection on all the people who fought for us, who gave their lives for us, who um, served in many different ways. All the men and women who served in any of the armed forces. I just want to thank every one of them for what they did, the, the injuries that they uh, received during war. Um, just a time to, to sit back and, and remember um, all these years and the freedom that we have that's why we have this freedom, is because of people who fought for it. I just want to thank every one of them for that. Thank you and God bless. This is Bruce Johnson. I served in the United States Army and achieved the rank of Specialist E-5. I was a combat medic in Vietnam with the 1st Air Cavalry, serving with a an infantry company. Saw hostile action, including... Uh, Soldiers who were wounded that I treated, as well as soldiers who lost their life or killed in action. And I myself was uh, severely wounded, but by the grace of God made it home and was able to live a good life after Vietnam. In terms of what Memorial Day means to me, I think of it as a day to honor all of those who have served their country and honorably uh, carried out their duties and also for the tens of thousands even hundreds of thousands who paid the ultimate sacrifice in service to their country and I think of them and I honor them on this day and also my fellow veterans who I served with and know and appreciate so Memorial Day is a special day and I I'm glad we take time to honor our veterans. I thank God for the privilege of living in this country and for the freedoms that we have. Paul Blumdahl, Staff Sergeant, United States Air Force Vet, who saw duty in Texas, California, Florida, and North Dakota from March 1967 through December 1970, and also Da Nang, Vietnam from June 69 to June 1970. Memorial Weekend is a time to focus feelings on our faith, family, friends, freedom, flags, flowers, sometimes fond farewells, and even food. It's a time for recognizing, reflecting, remembering, respecting, and revering. To me, it's a time for serious, even somber, reflection of disfigured, emaciated, missing limbs, bodies, the unmistakable, unforgettable stench of burning human flesh, of individuals bearing lifelong physical, emotional, and mental scars of battle, of remembering people who by what they said and what they did were willing to risk all that they were and all that they had for you and 
for me. May God help us so we never forget. Thank you for those that were involved in the video, and thank you for John for putting that together. And we do appreciate um, the price that's been paid for our country for the freedoms that we have. There's these four freedoms that have been known and talked about: the freedom from want in America, the freedom from fear, the freedom of speech, and the freedom of worship. And uh, that's something that we're going through even now in our state and a lot of other states. The uh, COVID-19 quarantine sessions and seasons that we've gone through and some of those restrictions. And um, if you are here in Minnesota, you probably realize that our governor, Governor Waltz, did a, uh, uh, a, new, a new way, kind of a step forward with churches that churches can meet with just 10 people inside, but they can meet outside. And so we are... Um, of course, struggling with that in a sense because we want so bad to be able to get together, gather together, to worship together here. And it's been kind of fun in a way because it's kind of propelled us to this video technology that we've never done before as a church. And a lot of churches, a lot of pastors have never done that. So it's kind of propelled us into that. But uh, it'd be great to be able to get together again. And so um, in the midst of my kind of frustration and uh, uncertainty of when, when we can gather and how we're going to do that. Um, I think about Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that all things, God's going to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so we do believe God is working his, his will. God is working for good. And I'm trying to be obedient to the word of God that says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. So in the midst of this, Tough time. Um, we want to rejoice. And the word rejoice means kind of an exuberant response of praise and worship. So, um, and then, of course, Philippians 4, same thing. Rejoice in the Lord always. And Paul says, again, I say rejoice. And he wrote that from a prison cell. So um, we want to be obedient to the Lord. And we want God to move and God to direct us. And so if you will, no matter where you're watching this, if you're in Minnesota, Liberia, Norway, or across the United States somewhere, be praying for our church here, but also all the churches in Minnesota and in, in the United States that are trying to figure out how they can go about meeting together, gathering together. And my heart goes out to people that uh, some are just newly saved, some are getting set free from drugs, and they relied so much on the, the, the ability to pray together, to meet together. So we want to pray for them and we want God to do his work in our lives. But we're in a series on the Holy Spirit. And I want to emphasize again and this whole idea that the Holy Spirit is not an inanimate power or force. It's not an it, but it's an important part of the Trinity. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When Jesus commands us to go preach the gospel and baptize those that are believers, he uses the Trinity. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we believe the Holy Spirit is the very presence of God. And in John 16, Jesus said, your hearts are sad now, 
But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come. But if I depart, I'll send him to you. So we have to understand, as, as romantic as it sounds, as good as it sounds, the idea that, boy, if I could just be walking with Jesus, walk along the shoreline, see him do the miracles. Jesus said it's to our advantage, to the disciples' advantage, to our advantage, that he went away. And when Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit, he never referred to the Holy Spirit as an it or just some inanimate power. But in John 16, again, he says, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me. He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So there is the he. There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm teaching you on the Holy Spirit. We're doing a series on the Holy Spirit, and I want to make sure we understand. What we believe and practice about the Holy Spirit, what we experience about the Holy Spirit, always has to go back to the Bible. What does the Bible say about it? Where is that in the Bible? Tell me where that is in the Bible. I want to see what Jesus said. I want to see how it, the apostles lived that out. And so we, we always ask that question. What does the Bible say? And so today... Again, we're looking at a lot of Bible verses about the Holy Spirit, what God is telling us. Now, to help us understand who he is and who Jesus is and who the Holy Spirit is, God, when he moved on men to write the scriptures, the Bible says it was the Holy Spirit that actually moved on men. They wrote these things down for us. They used a lot of metaphors. Now, a metaphor is something that we're familiar with, and yet it's describing something else. And so... When God writes about himself, he uses a lot of metaphors that we would be familiar with to help us in our relationship with him. When he writes about Jesus Christ, he, again, it's a lot of metaphors, a lot of symbols or types or names that we're familiar with to help us understand who he is. So when we read about the metaphors in the Bible about God, the, he's called the creator, the everlasting father, the king, the king of kings, the rock, the living God, the healer, the ancient of days, which means, you might remember a song we used to sing, Ancient of Days, which means the judge, the father of lights, the father of ages, the mighty one, the one who's more than enough, the all-powerful, the prayer-answering God, and, of course, many more. When he uses metaphors and words to describe Jesus, he says he's the Lamb of God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's our high priest. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the branch from Jesse, which means... He descended from Jesse. He's a descendant of King David. He's the bread of life. He's the bridegroom, the door, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection and the life, the good shepherd, the son of God, the light of the world, the true vine. I mean, there's all these metaphors that, especially those living there in Israel, would really understand. They'd have a relationship. They'd understand that whole idea of what that is talking about. And then when we talk about metaphors about the Holy Spirit, he's called the counselor. He's called the earnest. He's called our God, our helper, our advocate, our living water, oil, bread, power of the Most High, the promise of the Father, the seal, the spirit of the living God, the spirit of truth, the spirit of life, the water of life, the wind, the breath, and many more. So all of these metaphors, if you're ever looking for something to study at a Bible study with some friends or coworkers or whatever, you say, hey, you know, we should do a Bible study. What can we do a Bible study on? Of course, you can always do a Bible study in one of the books, but... You could actually pick one of those. Say, you know what, let's study the metaphors that God uses to describe him or the metaphors that God uses to describe Jesus, the metaphors, all these metaphors. I go through these, it's like, man, alive, I'd love to preach and teach on all of these. Now, last Sunday, we talked about the Holy Spirit is like water. You, that's how Jesus referred to him, as living water. One of the verses I didn't mention last Sunday, but I think it's a great verse, is in Titus 3, 5, where... Paul writes this. He says, It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing and the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So the idea is that the Holy Spirit comes in our life and he begins to wash us. He cleanses us from our sin. Well, another example, another metaphor they use about the Holy Spirit is that of the wind. So we're going to talk today about the Holy Spirit and the idea of the Holy Spirit as wind. In John 3, 7 and 8, he speaks to Nicodemus. He says this, Jesus says this, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. You cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. Now, he uses those phrases, born of the Spirit, born again. 
And he says for us to enter in, to be part of his kingdom, we need to be born again. We need to be born of the Spirit. But then he uses that phrase where he says, just like the wind blows, you hear the sound or you see it or you hear the sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now remember on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. Now next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, it's always wonderful to come together and worship the Lord on Pentecost Sunday. We won't be able to do that here as we gather together. But hopefully on Pentecost Sunday, um, you'll be able to, to listen in and watch and kind of renew your desire and renew your, your thirst for more of the Holy Spirit. But in Acts 2, describes the day of Pentecost, and it says this, Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a mighty or a violent, some versions say violent, mighty, rushing wind, it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So it's talking about the day of Pentecost. This was the, what Jesus referred to as the promise of the Father. Jesus referred to it, you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist said, Jesus, will, Jesus I'm going to baptize him in the water, but he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So there's that phrase that we read in Scripture that we get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now on that day, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, it says, there came from heaven a noise like a mighty rushing wind. Now, we don't know if they actually felt a violent, mighty rushing wind, or they just heard it. You know, even when I was on my bed the other night, it was like the wind started blowing. You could hear the wind blowing outside. It makes a certain sound. Sometimes when it's a strong wind, how it hits our windows, you can hear it. Now, we don't know if they heard it or they felt it. It was there. But when we talk about the Holy Spirit as wind, the Holy Spirit is like wind in the way that it can be seen. It cannot be seen, but it can be felt. And in John 3, verse 8, where he says, the wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear it, you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. Even the science of meteorology, and you talk to the meteorologists, and you watch them on TV, and uh, we've had situations here at our church where uh, we're trying to figure out, you know, should we cancel church? Is a snowstorm coming? Is it not coming? What's going to happen? And you talk to a meteorologist, you watch the news, you listen to the radio, try to figure out where it's going to come. And, and sometimes we think, okay, it's going to come here to Duluth at a certain time, so we better cancel church. It's a major snowstorm. You cancel church, and all of a sudden, it never came. It, it, it hung up somehow at Hinkley, and it moved a different direction. With all the best science still, we can't always determine where the wind is going to end up and where the storm is going to come. Now, it's interesting. The wind can't be seen, but it can be felt. There's something that happens. We, we sense it, we feel it, but we can't see it. And this happens in prayer means. It happens as you read the word. You begin to feel it. You sense it, but you can't see it. You know, it's interesting. The Bible talks about us as Christians being like trees. In Psalm 1, it says we shall be like trees planted by the water. Jeremiah 17, verse 8, talks about us being like trees, a, a fruitful tree. Psalm 1, Psalm 92, there's that reference as Christians, we're like trees. This is what's interesting about trees and wind. The wind actually helps trees become stronger. This is a science. When the trees are raised in a biosphere, meaning a covered up area, a very controlled area, they found that the trees that were raised in there with no wind actually didn't mature the same as trees planted outside where the wind is moving them. Before they matured within the biosphere, as they were growing up, they got tall, but they were never strong enough, and they'd collapse upon their own weight. So the presence of wind makes a tree stronger. So here we are. The, the, as the wind, as the Holy Spirit comes into our life and moves us, we become more mature. A study was done with young tree saplings. Some were tied down with ropes. Some were tied down with very few ropes. Some were tied down with no ropes. They found out the trees that weren't tied down were actually healthier than the trees that were tied down and staked down. There's something that happens as a tree moves, as the, whole, as the wind blows, <laughs> the tree gets stronger. How does that happen? Well, part of it, they say, is the tree sways it moves the roots. The roots then loosen up the soil so water can get down to it. It says in hot climates, the wind, the breeze comes and begins to move away the hot air and brings more fresh air. We know that wind carries the seeds and the pollen from these trees to help spread the growth of trees. 
multiplies the trees. And uh, for you that have allergy, uh, you have allergies during this time with the winds blowing and there's a lot of allergies, a lot of pollen, you experience that. The other thing that we understand about the wind, and this is what I want to center in on today, the wind moves things. The wind moves things. Just as the Holy Spirit moves and wants to move us, the wind moves things. Think about boats in Bible days. No motors, no engines. They had to be moved by manpower, oars, or the wind. They had a sail on them. And so the much preferred way for a boat to be moved was by the wind. They had to be aware of the wind direction. They had to set their sail just the right way. Talk to somebody that works on sailboats, and he was talking about that, how you have to learn how to adjust your sail to, so the wind is going to move you along. We've all probably heard the poem about Columbus. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He had three ships and left from Spain. He sailed through sunshine, wind, and rain. He sailed by night. He sailed by day. He used the stars to find his way. The whole idea that the wind, the wind moved Christopher Columbus to our areas. I don't know if you know the, the names of the ships that were there. If we can put that, does anybody know the ships there in your homes? Does anybody know the names of those ships? Santa Maria, Pinta, and Nina. Nina. <laughs> and so these three ships, this is a picture. Somebody actually took this picture. No, I'm just kidding. This is a drawing of what these ships probably look like. But they had huge sails, and they had to come at a time where they understood how the winds were going to blow, and they came to America. The other way that we've seen how the wind moves things and helps people is uh, the way I have uh, windmills. Most of us have never grown up on a farm, but you probably have driven by farms that have the old, even the old windmills sitting there. In the 30s and 40s especially, they were very helpful that they would go way down to the water level, and when the wind would blow the propeller, it actually moved down the gears, it actually brought the water up. So the wind and the water, and we know those are symbols of the Holy Spirit, but I just idea that, that the wind moves things for our good, the wind moves things, and the Holy Spirit wants to move us. We see this in the life of Jesus. In Luke 4, verse 1, he was baptized in water. He was baptized in water that says the Holy Spirit came down upon him like a dove. And then it says after he left the Jordan River, he was full of the Holy Spirit. In Mark 1, after that happened, Mark 1 records, he says the Holy Spirit compelled him to go into the desert, or some places say the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. So that word compelled. Jesus Christ was compelled or urged by the Holy Spirit to go into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He was urged. He was compelled. The Holy Spirit was pushing him to go into the desert. In Luke 4, 18, when he comes out of the desert, comes out of that conquering that temptation, Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. And then he says this, He has sent me, so the Holy Spirit sent Jesus to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to preach the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was propelled, he was moved, and he was sent by the Holy Spirit. And I believe this, the Holy Spirit wants to move us. The Holy Spirit wants to move us. In Ephesians 1, verse 20, and Romans 8, verse 11, it says, the same Spirit, the same power, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the same Spirit that he moved in wants to move within us and wants to empower us. Romans 8, verses 13 and 14, it says, if you live according to the flesh, and if you know anything about Romans 8, Romans 8 is right after Romans 7. Now, that's pretty mind-boggling when you think about that. Romans 7, Romans, yeah, okay, it's so right after. Romans 7 talks about the struggle of the flesh. Romans 8, over 20 times, it mentions the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So in Romans 8, 13 and 14, Read through Romans 8 sometimes. Just read that through. Maybe for your night devotion tonight, Sunday night devotion with your family. Read through Romans 8. But Romans 8, 13 to 14 says this. If you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you're going to live. For all who are led by the Holy Spirit are children of God. Those that are led by the Holy Spirit. Those that are empowered and led by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit wants to move us. Galatians 5, 16. And it's a huge part there, again, where, where Paul is, again, 
talking about the importance of walking by the Holy Spirit. He uses these, this phrase. He says, verse 16, Walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 25, Paul says this, If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Galatians 5 is an important part of understanding that there is the flesh, not talking about our body and our blood, he's talking about that natural part of us, he says, if you live by that, you're going to die. You're going to struggle. But if you can be lived, live and be empowered by the Holy Spirit, keep in step with the Holy Spirit. In other words, think of it when you're walking with somebody. Sometimes if you're walking with somebody, they've got really long legs and a big step. It's hard to keep up. But you, 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 you make an effort to keep up with that person. You're keeping in step with them. Uh, I married a woman who was shorter than me and has shorter legs. And so when we've gone out walking... She'll have to tell me, walk slower. Don't take such big steps. And so we're staying in step. And the, the Bible tells us, keep in step with the Spirit. God wants to move us by the Holy Spirit. In John 6, 63, he says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words I speak are spirit and life. Romans 8 says, The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed, again, so we have this idea, it's controlling us, it's urging us, it's keeping, we're, we're, we're walking with it, we're, we're being moved by it. The mind governed, taking over control, the control of the Holy Spirit, we're submitting to the Holy Spirit as our government, it's governing us. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. I want to give you three examples this morning how people were moved by the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. We're just going to look at three, there's many examples. The first one is the example of Philip. In Acts 8... Philip, who was a deacon, chosen you know, by the apostles, chosen by the church to be a deacon. A deacon in those days, they took care of all the natural things, so the elders and the leaders didn't have to take care of those. So it says, the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over, walk alongside the carriage. So Philip ran up, heard the man reading from Isaiah 53. Philip said, next to this man, he's running up, he catches up, he, he's... He's looking into this carriage, and he looks over, and the man's reading from Isaiah 53. Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, no, can you explain it to me? And it says, Philip shared with him all about Jesus. Isaiah 53, he's reading that. It's a prophecy. It goes through, like, the death of Jesus in detail. And Philip talked to him and explained to him, that's a prophet, that's a prophecy about Jesus. The Holy Spirit wants to move us. Philip, go over to that to that carriage. And it was an Ethiopian eunuch, which was somebody from probably lower Egypt, somebody maybe not from what we call modern-day Ethiopia, but he was from Africa. The second example, how the Holy Spirit wants to move us, is the example of Ananias. Some of you are very familiar with this story about Ananias. In Acts 9, there's a man by, called Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Jewish leader. And he had authority given to him to go and persecute the church. And Jesus appeared to Ananias as he was on his way with papers. He was on his way to capture more Christians and put them in jail. And the Bible actually says that he was killing men and women. These Christians, they were dying for their faith because of Saul of Tarsus. So it says that he was traveling. Jesus appeared to him and spoke to him. And then, in Acts 9, the Holy Spirit comes to a man named Ananias and says, I want you to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. Now, Ananias does not want to go and pray for Saul of Tarsus. And you know why, right? Because Saul of Tarsus is persecuting the Christians, and now God is telling Ananias, hey, go pray for Saul of Tarsus. He's there waiting for you. It's like, yeah, right. He's waiting for me. He wants to, he wants to throw me in jail or maybe kill me. But in Acts 9, verse 15, it says, go. Again, God is telling him, go. Now, remember, Philip, God said, go to that chariot. To Ananias, he comes, he says, go, for he's someone I've chosen. So again, here we're talking about the Holy Spirit trying to move. He's moving in people's lives. He's telling them to go, get up and go. The third example, and of course he does. He goes and prays. He goes to that house. He prays for Saul of Tarsus, now he's later called the Apostle Paul. He was a Roman citizen. Saul was the Jewish name. Paul was his Roman name. He became the great apostle who wrote much of the New Testament. The third example is the example of Peter in Acts 10. So 
So in Acts 10, it starts out with Peter praying. And he's praying, God gives him a vision of, of unclean food, food that Jews should not eat. They, were, they felt restricted from the Old Testament. So God tells him to eat the food in the dream, in this vision. And Peter says, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm a full-blooded Jew. I'm not going to eat what's you know, unclean. And God says, don't call unclean what I call clean. Eat. And then God tells him, there's somebody going to come and get you. Go with them. In other words, that word, get up and go with them. So Peter obeys the Lord. Peter goes with these people. And who does he meet? He meets Cornelius. Cornelius, a Roman soldier. Now, the Roman soldier, he was praying. And God spoke to him and said, I want you to send for Peter. So Peter comes, and as Peter is preaching Jesus to them, in Acts 10, verse 34, Peter says, I now truly understand that God does not show favoritism, but he welcomes those from every nation to fear him and to do what is right. He's telling them about Jesus. There's a phrase, I think that's an important phrase, it says, God's grace is for every race. And we see that here. We see, first of all, we saw that there was a, a man from Africa. God brought the gospel to him. We see there was this full-blooded Jew. God brought the gospel to him. We see here that Cornelius, a Roman soldier, somebody from Europe, a European. God brought the gospel to them. And aren't you glad for that? I'm Norwegian and German. I, you know, I'm so glad God has his grace for every race. There's not just one race. It's God's grace for every race. So Philip goes, Ananias goes, Peter goes. And he realizes that God's got a message for them about Jesus Christ and they get saved. The Holy Spirit wants to move us. So if you look at Peter, Peter is a leader in the Christian church. Right? He's one of the main leaders. He goes to a Roman soldier, a European. That's understandable. You say, well, yes, of course, Peter should go because he's a leader. He's got to go. Well, there's Philip. Philip, and we know him, he's a deacon. Well, of course, of course he's got to go. He's a deacon. Deacons need to go. They need to be obedient. But this is the cool thing. Ananias was a layperson. Now, maybe you don't understand what a layperson. We call people that aren't part of the organized leadership of a church a layperson. So basically, almost all the people that attend a church, all Christians, in a sense, are lay people. You could say, well, they're just a lay person. But we say just with sarcasm, because I like to look at us as a church. We're a church with a few pastors, but we're many ministers, hundreds of ministers. The lay person goes to the full-blooded Jew, Saul. I think that's just so interesting. <laughs> Peter, the leader goes to a Roman soldier. Philip, a deacon, goes to a man from Africa. Ananias, it says he was a follower. He was just a follower of Christ. He goes to Saul. So what should we do? How, how do we apply this to our life? Well, meditate. Number one, meditate on the mandate. Jesus said to go into all the world. So that's true for every one of us, to go into all the world. Jesus said you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, and that includes Duluth, Superior, that includes all the United States, that includes every part of the world. Number two, what should we do? Ask God to fill you and fill your life with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 4, 29, it says, after doing these things, after they were being beaten, they were told, don't preach the gospel anymore. After that, they met together and they prayed, and they said, oh, Lord, give us boldness that we could proclaim the gospel. Every one of us needs to be praying that way. It's not just for the leaders. It's not just for the deacons. Every person, every Christian needs to be praying, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me boldness, Lord. Help me to have boldness to share the gospel with people. That's number two. Number three, go and do what God tells you to do. Somebody said, you can't spell gospel without spelling go, G-O. You can't spell God. Two-thirds of God is Go. Jesus left heaven and he came down to earth. We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel. What should we do? Meditate on the mandate. Jesus said, go into all the world. That includes your workplace. That includes your school. That includes the place that uh, you do your recreation. Ask God to fill you with his spirit. Go and do what God tells you to do. And number four, let God be God. You know, the disciples were asking, well, who can get saved then? 
Who can get saved? Jesus was talking about the you know, people that love money so much they can't get saved. Jesus said, these things are not possible with man, but they're possible with God. And maybe there's somebody in your life around you that you think, well, that person's never going to get saved. I don't think that person's ever going to come to the Lord. They're not open to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 15 to 20 says, be careful how you live. Do not live like people who aren't wise. Live like people who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity. This, is, this applies to every one of us. Make the most of every opportunity for the days are evil. Don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord wants or the will of the Lord. Don't fill yourself with wine. Get drunk. Getting drunk will lead to wild living. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speak to another, one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord and always give thanks to God the Father for everything. As we study the subject of the Holy Spirit, I want to close with this one verse, Luke 11, verse 33. Jesus said this, If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? That's a great promise from Scripture. We're going to close with a song. And the song is it's based on that scripture where it says the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us. And I love this song. I love the thing that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, the same power that moves mountains, the same power now lives in us. That's the Holy Spirit. So as you sing this song, as you read the words, maybe in a place you just don't feel like you can sing out loud, but I encourage you to say these words and, and let the Holy Spirit come into your life. And maybe you even want to pray as we close the service, even as, as you, before you go through your day. You want to pray, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Use me, empower me. But maybe you even want to spend some time praying with your spouse, praying with your children, saying, you know, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit uses us and the Holy Spirit uses our family. So as we sing this song, join your hearts. Let it be, let it be a song that truly is um, a real intentional plea of your heart that God's going to move in your life. I can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me I can hear the sound of nations rising up I will not be overtaken I will not be overcome I can walk down this dark and painful road I can face every fear of the unknown all God's children singing out, we will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us, lives in us. The same power mountains when he speaks the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us lives in us lives in us lives in us we have hope that his promises are true in his strength there is nothing we can't do Yes, we know there's a greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same power that commands the dead to raise. Lives in us. Lives in us. The same. See?
Rebecca mentioned that? All right, well, we're going to introduce you guys. This is Mr. Jesse Fury and his wife, Brittany Fury. That's fun. Uh, we like to close uh, these kind of videos with the idea that you are going to connect with people. Um, we are hearing about people getting laid off. We're hearing about people that are not able to get unemployment. Um, they're struggling. And I think it's important for us to understand, as the Bible says, one member hurts, we all hurt together. And so be aware of some of the people that maybe you'd usually see on a Sunday morning. You'd sit by or think of some of the senior citizens or shut-ins and... Um, be thinking about some of these people and give them a call. So stay connected on Facebook, Instagram, or somehow. Stay connected. I had a couple of people call me this week. They just asked how I was doing, and then they prayed for me over the phone, and then I prayed for them. And it was, it was a great way to connect. And uh, be bold about that, to say, hey, let me pray for you. How can I pray for you? And God's going to use that. So, Lord, we just thank you for your wonderful grace, your grace that really reaches every, every race. And, Lord, you want to use each one of us. So, Lord, we just go now as we go through this day, and we ask you to use us no matter where we go, no matter where we are, use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. Thanks for worshiping with us.